Welcome to Suncoast In Depth. I'm Pastor Brett Watson, and I'm joined here by my good friend, Kevin O'Hara, good friend and and failed former pastor himself. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are, we have been actually talking about a, a topic that on the surface, most people would think of as, well, yeah, it's yeah. just love. I mean, we all know what love is. But we've been talking about it almost ad nauseum because it's not obvious what love is. Right. Right? And it's – they wouldn't just say – I think that, that what they would say is how important it is. You know, yeah. love is, is central to everything. But defining uh, it is – Defining – right. To ask, well, what is it then, you know, yeah. is a very difficult thing to do. So just right. kind of go into what we – you know, what we've been – talking about in my office um, around the around the definition well I think it just started with you know um, this the kinds of discussions that you and I have had for years uh, where that will challenge uh, our own beliefs the the beliefs of religious communities of and of scientific communities um, just trying to get at the truth and you know one of the things that that you realize when you start thinking about human behavior uh, is that first, you know, we know that humans have evolved uh, over time, just like every other species on the planet. And we have behavioral adaptations that are good for survival. Um, And it's not hard to see that, you know, let's say loving your children being willing willing to protect your children uh, would be something that would be a natural adaptation. It would be good for the species. It would help us survive. It fits in with evolution. It fits evolution. in with evolutionary theory, right. And so one could just make the argument, hey, look, love is just, you know, love in that way. Uh, love for a spouse as well could just be chalked up to an evolutionary adaptation that helps us survive as a species. And so... You know, the question then arises, well, you know, what would make it more than that? What would make it something, you know, spiritual, eternal, transcendent? Uh, and that question what, arises pretty much in everyone who experiences love, really. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they – do you think that it, it arises like they really ask themselves, they think deeply, like what is love? No, not necessarily in a conscious way, but it, but not asking what is love, but um, kind of innately believing that it's something more than just a survival. Yes, thing. I would agree. Yes, I think that that's what most people – how most people feel. Um, but so when you look at the history of our species um, – Things like hate and anger uh, were also survival traits. That's why those things evolved. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I've often said that we're here today uh, because not because our great great grandfather going back a thousand generations was good at loving his neighbor. We're here because he was good at bashing his neighbor's head in with a rock and taking his food <laughs> and his wife <laughs> so, and his wife, right? Uh, and his well, and however many women. That's right. And that and so that that is a you know. Uh, that is a survival trait as well. Selfishness is a survival trait, mm-hmm. you know? So um, there's a lot of, so in, in that context, what makes love better than hate? They're both just emotions that um, have evolved in humans. And so what makes, well, what makes hate not only something that, because I think that most religious people would say that, well, hate is something spiritual too. Yeah, and it's very it's negative. It's a bad thing. At least love is in, something spiritual, and it's a good thing. Yeah, you know, at least in certain forms of it or something. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, again, this is right. complicated. It's complicated, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that on the whole, hate is also you know comes from some spiritual origins, or is at least related to something spiritual, and that it's a bad thing. Love is something spiritual, and it's a good thing. Um, how, how do you decide that exactly, you know, and it's, you know, living in the 21st century where that we don't have to compete for food and, you know, there's, uh, we have societies now, um, it, it's, it would be easy time to think time to think. Right. And, and that 
kind of a setting where there's, you know, scarcity is not the issue that it used to be, even just a few hundred years ago. Um, it's easy, I think, for us to say, in, in that in that kind of a setting, now we're in a place in human history where, yeah, you can see that that hate probably is not going to be a good thing for survival. Love would be a better thing than hate once you have the kind of infrastructure uh, that allows for cooperation uh, and so forth. That's going to be – hate is going to become something that's not useful like it used to be. But that happens in evolution all the time. Right. And so then that – then it's – you know, a, an evolutionary biologist or psychologist would say, yeah, and so, you know, uh, in 10,000 years um, – Almost nobody will ever even feel the emotion of hate, of hatred, because we'll evolve away from it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, so what we were questioning was: is is there a way to define love? Is there a way to quantify it? Is there a way to uh, measure it? Uh, and, and if any of those things are, if you can do any of those things, is there anything in there uh, that would give you reason to believe? that it's something more than just biological evolution. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the, um, some of the examples that show that this is, uh, or at least seem to show that, that love is something more than biological. Right. And the example, <laughs> the example yeah. that we came up with was when I asked you, um, well, what happens if, you know, an alligator attacks your dog? Yeah, right. What are you willing yeah. to do out right. of love for your dog? And that's right? a, it's a good example. Mm -hmm. um, because what we're looking for uh, is something about love that would not arise naturally through yeah. evolution or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, uh, I have – I had two dogs – Pepita and Foxy. Pepita's still with us, but uh, but Foxy passed away. Um, and I, you know, I loved that dog. I've always been an animal person. I love, I'm an animal lover. Mm -hmm. I love animals. Okay. Um, and I love my pets. I've always been someone who just falls deeply in love with their pets. But Eve, even as a person like that. That's why I, I love Kyle. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's a pet guy. Um I, I've never loved an animal the way I love this little 10-pound chihuahua. It, I mean, I just love this dog on a level that I can't really describe. Um, I, I loved her as much, I think, as I've ever loved any human. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, uh, you know, that example was, you know, if, a, if I was walking Foxy next to a, a lake or a pond and, and a gator came up and grabbed her, uh, without even thinking about it, I would jump on that gator, or even if I had a moment to think about it and realize I might get chewed up to the point, uh, you know, where I might have a limp the rest of my life, I might, or it might even kill me, there would still be no way that I would not do it. I would do anything it took I, I, in a compulsory way. I wouldn't even be able to stop Even if myself. the gator is 20 feet long. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just, there's no way I could just stand and, and watch uh, my dog being chewed to death by a gator. I couldn't do it. There's no way I could do it. I don't think I could either. You know, so, so. You know, the number of things, and it started me thinking about, well, what, what kinds of things would I sacrifice for Foxy, that was Foxy's well-being? And I realized that the kind, I would be willing to make sacrifices in my life uh, for her that would be equivalent to the kinds of sacrifices I would make for people that I loved deeply. Now, I mean, obviously, they're a little different, you know, because – the things that she needs as a dog are different than things humans yes. need, right? So uh, the sacrifices couldn't be the same. But in terms of maybe, you know, the the degree uh, that I would be willing to go to, um, the, the the adversity I would be willing to accept, like getting chewed up by an alligator, for her benefit um, are shockingly high. 
And I, I, you know, the feeling I get is that when I tell people that, I think most people don't get that. Like they don't. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, so. Well, let's ask Kyle. Would you, if you saw an alligator grab your pet, would you jump in on top of the alligator to try to save the pet? Your cat, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he is. That sounds like a no to me. He's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I love my cat, but he wakes yeah, me up a right. lot. You know, <laughs> maybe you're right. <laughs> yeah, I, I just. A dog would be different. A dog would be different. It would. Yeah, why would, would a dog you, be different? Because you feel closer to dogs. That I, I think so. I mean, I love my cat, and the, probably in the moment it'd be different, but I don't know something about. Yeah. Can you imagine having a dog that you love that much? Yes, yeah. So you can imagine it. Was my childhood this isn't going to pick you up, is it? I mean, you just repeat what I'm saying. Yeah, you've said a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> he he might do it for a dog. Yeah. My, like, but is that is that related to dogs? They seem to be more more conscious than cats. Uh, I think I that's. They're, just, they're more obsessively loving. They're obsessively yeah, loving they give themselves. You something yeah, back, right. they do. They give a lot. Yeah, they're, right. I call them four-legged Jesus. Yeah, cats. Yeah, cats, cats, cats do don't not seem display to care. that kind of right. affection. Yeah. But you know, but see, even there. So when we started talking about that, you know, um, so yeah, dogs do seem more affectionate, and in fact, I mean, they are. Pretty, it's widely accepted by uh, historians, or well, I guess. It would be anthropologists, and it's widely accepted that dogs were the first animals that we um, domesticated. Didn't, yeah, domesticated. Yeah. So, and that there was this, there became this sort of symbiotic relationship. Yeah, and um, and so it, so that too, it's natural for us to have affection for dogs, um, maybe more so than most other animals. Mm, yeah. But, um, but, so the point we were making when we were talking about that is. That I understood that while while Foxy had affection for me, it's that seemed obvious as well that she didn't love me the way I love her, and not, in fact, not even capable of right, that. and not yeah. even capable of that. And in fact, you know, for mo- especially smaller dogs, smaller dogs do seem to me anyway less. Uh, they don't get as attached as bigger dogs do to their owners. Like, you know, they may love you, but if you give them to somebody else who provides a good home for them, you know, yeah. they're fine. <laughs> you yeah. know, they, they'll be okay. Um, and and so with all of that, I mean, what does Foxy, what did she actually do for me except me loving her, holding her, petting her? Why did I... So to be get, fair, I mean, know, there is, there are, you know, there is a, a hormonal... Mm-hmm. Um, a change in us that's actually unique to dogs, as far as we know. Yeah, um, you know, like it is between humans. You know, a mother taking care of her child releases oxytocin. I think it is. Yeah, and, right. And this happens with dogs as yeah. well, for both the human and the dog. Right. And so that, and all the other animals that we've tested, um, at least last I checked. This was years ago, but um, none of them did that. None of them experienced that release of oxytocin. So there is something biological there yeah. between us and dogs. But the reality is that... Which probably evolved. It probably that did. probably yes, evolved. Yes, yes. But it evolved. The part that evolved, evolved, to be clear, because we domesticated wolves, which were ferocious and cunning hunters right. <laughs> that helped us to track right. down and kill game. Right. And it right? could warn us. When and your 10 pound pr- yeah. chihuahua can't do that. Cannot do that. Right. My, my 10 pound <laughs> chihuahua you were wondering. Yeah, offers no survival benefit to me at all. Right. None at all. Um, and in fact, you could even argue that the very fact that I would be willing to jump on an alligator, she, she endangers she's you. A, right. I mean, she, it's a deficit. <laughs> love is right? dangerous. L- right. That kind of love yeah. for an animal that can't do anything to help me survive, but that would cause me to surrender my life uh, or endanger myself is not, is the opposite of a survival <laughs> right. mechanism right, of right. any kind. Yeah. And so, um, you know, where does that come from? You know, where does something like that come from? And and I don't have an answer to that. Um, I've read pretty extensively on uh, evolutionary psychology, mm-hmm. and it does explain a lot. 
It does. It's, it explains a lot. I mean, I, I'm sure I haven't read as much as you, but I have read some, and it it does. It's pretty powerful. It is. Yeah. I mean, it, it perfectly explains, you know, why we love our children and why we love oh, our yeah. family and why, yeah. you know, I mean. To the chagrin of many. Right. Because they like to That's think right. that it's just, this is unconditional love. But it really isn't the best example of it unconditional isn't. love. The way right. we think of no conditions, right? Because right, because it the is condition clearly is, linked to our evolution. That's right. That's right. And so, uh, right. And so it it feels unconditional um, because it it may feel to you that well, you know, my child can't do anything for me, and I'm willing to give my life for it. Uh, but that's because it propagates the species, and you mm -hmm. know, so so that over time became woven into the fabric of your DNA. And so, yes, it's just there. You will just feel that way, you know? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem to explain the kind of love that a person like me can have for a dog. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not unique. No. There's lots of people. No, I would, would jump in fact, the we, gator. I right. Would. And we, uh, when we were in the class, yeah, the thing Sunday, who was it? She, she spoke up and she said, well, yeah, you shouldn't even have a dog if you're not willing to do that. Yeah. You know, yeah, so, that's right. um, you know, that's, um, a lot of people have so those here's a, here's feelings. something interesting that came to mind as we were talking about Foxy. I thought, would I jump in on the gator for Foxy? I would. Right. I would do that. <laughs> right. I, I just can't yeah. imagine that I wouldn't. Right. Why is that? Well, I mean, I love you. Right. Um, but not that, uh, you know, how much do you contribute to my survival and vice versa? Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Um, this is just really raises a lot of interesting questions. You know, would I do it for a strange dog? I think I would. Yeah. I think I would try to save a little helpless dog from a gator at my own peril. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. I haven't yeah. been faced with that, you know, situation. But it's, yeah. I feel like I would. Yeah. Why? So, yeah, I don't, but that, I don't know. But that does beg the question, you know, okay, so we have this evolutionary link. We have this sim, uh, symbiotic relationship with dogs that we know for certain. Um, is, is that coming into play here? So then I think, would I do that for a little cat? Like if I saw a cat being, I think I would. It's not as strong mm -hmm. an impulse, right. the feeling that I get, but it's there. Mm-hmm. That's even weirder. Yeah. What do you think? W would you? You know, I don't think I a strange cat. I no, I don't think I would. No, no. I mean, I might, you know, try and scare the gator off or something, but yeah. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, you know, put mm -hmm. my own life in peril to save it. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, I, it's, I just it, it feels impulsive to me, like. Right. Like it wouldn't make any sense at all uh, right. from any standpoint, right? But right. If I see, I've been like this since I was a kid. If I see what I perceive to be a, a, a defenseless animal being ravaged by another animal, it just mm -hmm. like, it sparks something in me. I, I don't know where that comes from, but yeah, um, I don't know. I might actually try to save that cat. And it, That's not as clear though, for yeah, sure. Yeah, right. I, I once I once uh, saved <laughs> a bird from a, a snake that had it. Uh, I was right over here at the celery fields. Now the thing is, is that's kind of weird though, because it's like, well, the snake needs to survive too. I know. You know, it, it's like so. I'm just loving yeah. the bird more than the snake. So, you know, I, yeah. what sense does that make? But this was the only. This is the example that we came up with to say um, how how could evolution, especially well with any kind of interspecies love like that, why would evolution cause something like that? You know, why would it, it cause me to love a little 10 pound dog to that degree? And, and I don't have a good answer for it. Now, I think that what a, you know, any biologist is going to say, obviously, is I'm going to say, well, just because you don't have an answer, maybe I don't have an answer either, doesn't mean it's God doesn't mean it's of some yeah. transcendent uh, yeah. spiritual thing. Um, but so. but the God answer is more than a gap. Uh, you know, it's not just a God of the gaps thing. It's a where does this come from question. And it seems to come from beyond 
evolutional development, right? Right. It, it seems to. Um, the more that you dig into it, the further removed it becomes, it seems, from our evolutionary development. And so that means that it's something else. It, right. It, I mean... Or it, it, it could be something else, yeah, is what I should say. Right. If, you know... I mean, in we don't fairness, understand the everything pro- about proponents our proponents of, of, you know, in well, intelligent design. Yeah, they will make that argument for, you know, if you if you can't find a natural way to explain, let's say, the origins of life, mm-hmm. well, maybe God's an answer. Um, I, I, you know, th- again, what people would say is, well, just because you can't find the explanation doesn't mean that just because you can't find a natural explanation doesn't mean that there's a supernatural one. Mm-hmm. That's where we should go with it. Um, but I think uh, it does raise the question. I mean, for me, at the very least, um, I've read a lot of intelligent design books, mm-hmm. and I don't agree with them. Mm-hmm. But I, I would say that, you know, intel- Michael Behe, who is a... Uh, a molecular biologist, I Best think. Best known it, for yeah, intelligent yeah, design. Yeah. At, at Lehigh University. I think he's at least one of the most credible, you know, guys out there. Um, I, I think that what he did do was he he raised, you know, challenging questions uh, for evolution, which is a good thing to do. I mean, he didn't, he didn't really, in my opinion, he didn't offer any other scientific explanation because, you know, you you have to bear in mind that the moment that you say, okay, well, I think God's responsible. Yeah. Um, In fact, Stephen Meyer, who is a intelligent design proponent, he will say, well, look, you're just, all we're doing is we are, I forget the exact phrase he uses, but we're, we're deferring to the best explanation. And so he'll talk about the code of life in DNA. Yeah, and he yeah. says, anytime we see digital information, uh, it's always been produced by a mind. Intelligence. Right, yeah. intelligence. And so he'll say, you know, DNA is, in fact, digital information. Everyone agrees with that. And so it must have come from a mind. That's, that is a, an explanation. And he will claim that... Uh, that scientists do that all the time. They're always saying, okay, well, what's the best explanation? But there is a difference there. The difference is that when a scientist says that, they mean what is the best explanation given the laws of physics, okay? That would, you know, can we start from some very simple laws that we can see can build up and give you a, a natural explanation? Where that what is happening is is that we are understanding all of those things down to the most to the simplest laws to the four forces of the universe and so forth, mm-hmm. um, and that we're seeing how all of that can emerge from these you know simple laws. The difference is is when you say, well, the best explanation is this eternal mind. Um, you have now gone to something else that we totally don't understand, that can't be falsified, that can't be, you know, so your your explanation that you're giving uh, would, would raise many more questions. There's a whole plethora of things that no one understands about, you know, the mind of some eternal deity. And so that it, there is a difference there. So there, the scientists are saying, yeah, we're deferring to the be- best understood explanation, where that we understand the There's process. The difference, and, yeah. and so there is, I would say that that is the difference. And you know, so when Stephen Meyer says, "Well, you know, every time we see examples of digital information, it's there was a mind that did it." Well, so what does he mean by that? Well, he specifically means a human brain, right? There was some human who sat down and did it because it's the only example we have that can do something uh, right like that, yeah. we don't know any we're the only examples that can do that and we think of ourselves as we, we have this mind but but clearly every example where we have done something like that it's while the mind resided in its brain okay the brain is working when we did that there weren't any spirits that we know of that <laughs> that wrote code right so um so and Our brains and our bodies and everything that we do uh, to create that information 
is based on the fact that, yeah, there's already information inside of us. There's, um, we're using the laws of physics to create that. Um, and so that's what a mind is that he says the only examples we have are of minds. But then, then what he wants to uh, say when he defers to the best explanation being a mind, well, but this mind is disembodied. We're in time. He says God is outside of time. There's all of these things. We have brains, physical gray matter. God presumably doesn't have physical gray matter. So in what way is that mind like the mind he's referring to? You know, so he's – in fact, why would you even call it a mind? Why not, you know? why not even just refer to it as intelligence? That's the way I've heard it said. Yeah, um, you could say that. You could that say there's intelligence that, it, involved. Right. So intelligence – is involved, but the only examples of intelligence that we have where we say intelligence created the code are these physical creatures in the universe with gray matter. Yeah. Still, you, know. you still end up going down the same Right, train. so you, you go to something for which you've never observed, you have no, um, you can't explain it, the thing that did it. And so that, I think, is one of the problems with intelligent design. However, you know, Michael Behe has he's pointed out things in evolution. Uh, he's pointed out structures in the bacterium, uh, in, yeah, bacterium and so forth. The the clotting factor yeah. in blood and the proteins. And he said, "Look, <clears throat> it's not clear how any of this could have evolved because the steps that it would take to evolve um, are themselves work against right. Evolution. They they don't work until you have everything there." Mm -hmm. And the steps in between that would not give you the benefit um, would, in fact, be a disadvantage. And so evolution would be working against it until it got to that point. So how did it ever evolve? Yeah, fairly I, 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 That's yeah. A, a compelling – that's a challenging yeah. question. Who's um, the guy from South Africa? His parents were um, biologist, and he's a physicist, a theoretical phys physicist at Oxford. Yeah, I can't he's remember He's also a devout Christian. What right. The heck is his name? But that guy but doesn't not agree. He, yeah. does, he is not a proponent of of intelligent design, and he explains right. very eloquently, I think, why he is not. You right. Know? I'm not going to go into all that, but um, I thought and, it was... and what they're saying, just to be clear, I mean, so obvious that guy believes in God. Um, in fact, he's a Christian. <coughs> um, he specifically, what he's saying is that. You don't. I don't believe that you have to invoke God. That once the universe was here, to you don't have to invoke things. God to explain what happened in creation. Right. That God created a universe where that the automated laws of physics were capable of producing everything that we see. Yeah, I think that's what he's. That's what he was say. getting at ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so back but does to, it produce love? <laughs> right, and, right, and, and that's the that's the thing that's so strange about love. It, you know what we've just been laying out um, has more to do with things that are quantifiable, right? You can't quantify God if you're going to end up right. with that conclusion, um, but you can quantify the code in DNA. You can say, yeah, this is what it this right. is what it's made up of, and. Um, and we even have animations that describe the process of building it. You know, mm -hmm. they, you've seen those. Yeah. Um, which is just mind blowing, right? Yeah. But. And, and in fact, those, you know, those animations you're talking about, mm -hmm. they're not really, I mean, they're actually, it, it's using, we use like electron microscopes yes. and, we, and we do all these things and we put together. So what we're putting together. It, it's I I just I want to make sure that people understand it's not like an animation that we created. Right. No, it I'm is the actual this. process. It is. We're yeah. actually seeing the act. We got that animation from the information we pulled uh, from the sensors that we use to detect it. Yes. Okay. Directly. And in and a that's, sense, observing the process right. itself. I mean, right. we basically took a video of the process happening in a very complicated way. Yes. Yes. That's what we did. No, that's good. I'm glad you, you clarified that. Right. Yeah, I don't mean like a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, right. This is what I think's happening. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. You know? yeah. Um but again, as mind blowing as all that is, we can observe it. Mm -hmm. We can see this. This is this is quantifiable, right? Right. 
But love escapes that. It seems. <clears throat> it seems to. I guess a lot of emotions do. But, That's right. Yeah. That's what I was just about to say. But so you and I sat down. It, that, that we consider the most powerful, right? It, it's the most yeah. powerful of yeah. emotions. It's the most mind-altering of emotions and habit-changing. It has the power to change the way we act in the world uh, more than others. Uh, but again, maybe that's just now in the 21st century. You know, Maybe. I mean, when you look at history and you look at you yeah, know, marriage was often the rivers of blood thing. that have right. been spilt, yeah. you know, so that some guy could be the momentary ruler of some little corner of the earth. The pale blue dot, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan said, yeah. um, you know, I mean, so it definitely seems that, that, that the emotions we call negative hate, greed, um, you know, narcissism, all those definitely shaped the world oh they did there's no question you know yeah um it, what what i what i'm getting at though is that we always view love as the thing that will overcome those negatives yeah eventually like it has to that's right. the way we see it right and there's a reason that we see it that way right and, and again i mean i think that evolutionary psychologists would say well yeah but that's because i mean the reason why you know, so many allied forces were willing to give their lives to fight against the evil of um, of Nazi Germany and fascism uh, was because we had already evolved to a place where that cooperation within our species, it was a survival trait. And so um, and so we were willing to do that even to the point of of giving our lives Um because it was natural for us now to do that. Now, there, I mean, there are some questions there. I've spent years, as you know, uh, you know, my vocation's in math and physics, but because evolution was such a hot topic for so many years, and, and you were a pastor, and I was a pastor, I, I just spent like decades studying evolution. Mm -hmm. And, and all, all of that time, there are still questions I have that I'm not clear on. Um, they say that evolution primarily works on the individual, not on the entire species. Um, I'm not clear. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that because no. it definitely has a, an impact on the whole species. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what they mean by that. Sometimes but it, even having the effect of a branching a new species even. Right. Yeah. I, I'm just saying that because, you know, what I just said about fascism is that if our species – we evolved in such a way that now caring for other others was a survival trait mm -hmm. for the whole species, but it might, might not be for the individual. Yeah. Right. So right. that's what I'm not clear on, but, um, well, that's, I should probably turn off my phone. <laughs> you warned me to do it and then I didn't do it. Let's see where it's here. I guess we can edit this though, right? We could if we wanted to take the time, but it's kind of funny. Yeah. And since it's so right. characteristic of you, yeah, right. we should probably just leave it in. Right. Uh, but, you know, we did this interest. We tried to um, start to quantify love. Like, how do you quantify yeah. it? How do you say, you know, there's this much love or more love or less love? You know, how, how do you decide, um, you know, how would you decide that maybe, you know, I love you more than someone who barely knows you, or, you know, you love your children more than uh, some stranger loves your children. You know, how would you quantify that? And the, the defining characteristic that we came up with, now it's a characteristic, it's not a concise definition. definition it's like right. the definition that biologists have for life in that it's not really a concise definition because they haven't been able to find one. Right. They've just have found defining characteristics, things that seem to always be true about life, but that can't seem to completely encompass it. And so what we found with love is that one of the defining characteristics seems to be that the person doing the loving is willing to subject themselves uh, to adversity for the sake of the, th the object of their love. Yeah, for right, and so that's where we came up with okay, like I'm willing to suffer being chewed up by an alligator 
so that my my little dog Foxy is not chewed up by the alligator, right? Yeah. So that seems to be a defining characteristic. And so then we were trying to, well, is there a way to quantify that? Is there a way to say, <clears throat> okay, right. The, what it seems like is the more your more adversity that you're willing to suffer on the behalf on behalf of the object of your love, the more you love them. It seems like that. It at first. seems like that. Then when you actually start to try and do it, gets sticky. It fast. gets sticky. It gets sticky very very fast. And yeah. I don't, you know, we don't have. We probably shouldn't go into all that. It's very complicated. <laughs> yeah. People aren't going to find <laughs> yeah. follow it. it will be but, interesting to but them, it, but. I, it just to say that it does get sticky fast. It, there's really hard things to describe because when you talk about things like adversity, um, you can talk about- Degrees you know, of adversity. Right, degrees of it. Yeah. You can talk about well-being versus uh, whatever the opposite of well-being is, if you want to give that a name. And you could create a scale where zero is your neutral. You don't have much well-being in your life, but you also don't have- much adversity in your life. And if you're living a good life, you know, your best life now, <laughs> you're at a 10, whatever. If um, you're eking out a s subsistence, you're barely surviving, maybe you're at a negative 10, you know. And so what, if you're willing, if you love someone, let's say, and you're somewhere on that scale, you're willing to move down on that scale so that person can move up on that scale. Um, but it's hard to quantify because you, you, as we discovered, it's like, well, gosh, if you're at a 10 and someone you love is at a negative 10, you know, um, and you can give up, you know, three points and move down to a seven to move them up to a f positive five. I mean, would you do that? Of course you yes. would do that. You know, of course you would do that. But then it becomes a little less clear. So, you know, um, if you're at a 10... Well, what if you're at a 10 and they're at a negative 10? <clears throat> are, are you willing to, to move down to a five uh, to get them up to zero? So you've lost five points to gain them 10. Well, it seems like, yes, you would probably do that too, right? Um, but, you know, what if you're at a zero, you know, are you willing to move to negative five so that they can get to a positive 10. Yeah. It's, you know, so it's, you can't just look at the, how much I'm willing to give up. You'd have to define it in some better way than that. And, um, it, and it breaks down into tinier and tinier minutia. Yes, <laughs> it know, does. The, the, more right. you, the more you dig into the right. circumstances. So, right. yeah, very difficult to quantify it. Right. And even to create like sort of some algorithm that would decide when do I act, when do I not act, Right. It's very, very hard to do that um, in that way. I mean, you could create one if it was just a matter of, well, what would, let's say, increase, well, the, give the most well-being to the most, the largest number of people or something. That's actually a little easier. It's still difficult. You know, because it's hard to even define what well-being is. That's <laughs> yes. a difficult thing to define. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, and so I think. At least, you know, my initial feeling is is that not being able to quantify it um, would sort of lend itself towards saying, okay, maybe it is something that is sort of transcendent, and that's why you can't quantify it, right? Um, but at the same time, the next thought that comes to my mind is, well, but if, if you can't measure it at all, you can't quantify it, and you can't measure it. Um, how do you? How would you ever say? Let's say, let's say you still have that defining characteristic, though. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm willing to suffer some adversity for someone I love. Okay, so that's a characteristic of of love. But how would one ever be able to say? I how how could you say I love my children more than you love my children? No, you know, based on any kind of a behavior, right? Yeah. How does one decide that? And so that means that you can't even say, the best you can do is say, well, it looks like, you know, this person loves me based on my defining characteristic, but I have no way of saying how much they love me. So then that renders statements that people make all the time, I love you more than anything in the world, meaningless. 
<laughs> what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Well, you know, just to be clear, yeah, what does that mean? Right. In that sense, meaningless. It obviously bears meaning for them and for the person right. they're speaking to, but again, quantifying that is yeah. Uh, how do you do that? Right. Well, what I, I guess what I'm saying is is if you say I love you more than anything else in the world, I guess what you can mean by that is I would be willing to suffer adversity for you more I'd, than anything I'd else. Be willing to, to lose, suffer more adversity or to for lose you. anything in the world. Right. Uh, but if you can't quantify that, if that can't be measured, if that will, then how how do you actually how do you actually say that really? You know. Um, so there is something. This leads to something interesting, I think, because <clears throat> there is something about human consciousness that does seem to transcend um, physical reality. Yeah. Because otherwise, where do we come up with these things? Like, mm -hmm. how do I, how do I, I'm trying to use symbols, words, to describe this powerful feeling that I have for this person or this animal or whatever, right? And, Knowing all, all the all the while that the language that I'm even using is is hyperbolic as it may seem, yeah, um, is is not really satisfactory language. It doesn't mm -hmm. really fully explain, and and so I'd use hyperbole to to um, to try to give expression to this feeling that I have. There's something like why do we why do we come up with that stuff? It, it's like, yeah. it's not, and you don't see it anywhere else. You don't see it in any other animal. Right. That's, you know, I mean, I, to me, that goes back to the hard problem of consciousness. Yes. And that's, you know, and and everybody I, I admits it's a hard at, problem. That, that yeah. love is associated with that very difficult problem of consciousness. Right. Right. And so, um, that I agree. or at least the scope of love that right. we experience and try to ex give expression to, yeah. As human and beings. there's a lot of things, you know. So, like when, a moment ago, when we were talking about you know DNA, well, we can measure it and we can quantify it and everything, and and then we say so. There's information there, but information, by the way, is another concept. That yeah. in science we haven't really defined. It's not something that we can have these defining characteristics, what we kind of mean by information, but it is perniciously difficult to give a, a concise definition of what we even mean by information. So, so, so the physicists that – the theoretical physicists that, that believe anyway that, that they have evidence to, um, to support the, the notion that – all of the universe is information. Mm -hmm. Everything is made up of information. Right. Um, again, you know, the way that you were talking about statements that people make are meaningless, that's kind of meaningless because we can't even define what information is. It, r yes. I mean, and again, I think it's partly because information is uh, in inextricably linked to awareness. Yeah. Of that information, Which I mean, gets it's back like to the it, sticky problem of consciousness. Of, of consciousness, right? So that's partly why I think it's difficult. We're going to have to look at more information on this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it's one of those things, though. And there seems to be a lot of concepts like this where that uh, I forget the politician they were talking about, uh, you know, pornography and where it should be allowed, where it shouldn't be allowed, and. Um, and so they were trying to define it, and they yeah. were having a hard time defining pornography. And the, and the one politician said, "All I know, I can't define it. All I know is I know it when I see it." You know, <laughs> and and I think that's. I mean, to be yeah. fair, yeah. I think that's. You know, we would say, "I know life when I see it." It is hard to give a concise definition. Um, you know, so, like okay, life is that which can reproduce itself. It uses fuel. It uses up fuel. Uh, to sustain and to reproduce itself, um, you know, fire meets that definition. Right. You know, it's like, it, so it, yeah. it's really hard, but it's like, we know we're not talking about fire. Right. You know, yeah. and so if, you know, we went to one of the moons of Jupiter and dropped a camera under the 
oceans of ice and you know, the camera's down there and all of a sudden we see this little weird creature come up and it has what looks like eyes and it pokes the camera and then it swims away that's life okay that we would know that's life right yeah, yeah. there's Nobody no would question we wouldn't, about it. Right, we wouldn't even bother yeah. we wouldn't have to look at its dna we wouldn't have, we would say okay there's that's life you yeah. know um so we know it when, when we happens. see it <laughs> yeah no me too <laughs> me too so so there's a lot of things like that. So information is that way. It's like, okay, it's really hard to give a very concise definition, but we know it when we see it. We know what we mean when we talk about information, you know. Um, Same thing's true of love to a large extent. Right. That's right. Yeah. We know it when we see it. Yeah. So, we know that we experience it. Yeah. But defining it, concisely defining it. Is difficult. Yeah. And I'm not giving up yet maybe we can concisely define it um well here's the thing i wanted to bring this up because as we were trying to figure out a formula right yeah (laughs) mostly you tried to figure it out because you're the math mathematician but um i was thinking to myself i wonder how many people would think that this is just stupid for us to spend time like this doing this. but it really it 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 was so obviously not a waste of time yeah, because of uh, even the, even the emotional benefit I got out of it. I don't know if this is true of you. We didn't talk about this, but mm-hmm. um, I, I just remember walking away from those discussions, going, "God, love is just so wild. Mm-hmm. It's so awesome. Like and right. it's so complex. And if we hadn't sat there and talked about trying to build a formula to quantify." Uh, love, I don't know if I would have ever thought of those things. Right. Because it, even the sort of provisional uh, defining characteristic that we came up with yeah. is, is a pretty good one. You know, so you could say to someone, look, if you're not willing to suffer adversity on behalf yeah, of you someone else, say well, you don't love them. Yeah, you don't love them. You don't love yeah. them. And that, you know, of course, you know, there's lots of passages in in the in the Bible, you know, Jesus saying, you know, if if you're you know, he who is willing to no greater love has a man than if he's willing to give his life for his neighbor. And he says to pick up your cross and follow me. So there's lots of places where uh in in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian scriptures where you are admonished to be willing to suffer adversity on behalf of others. Yes, right? even so, your enemies. Even your enemies, right. That's, that's the kind of right. so counterintuitive uh, message it is. Of, of, in particular, Christ, right? Right. And that, you know, when you look at that, I, I think it was Gandhi that said, you know, an eye for an eye just leads to the whole world being blind. Yeah. And so I, I agree that I think you see this sort of moral progression through the Hebrew scriptures into the Christian scriptures, mm-hmm. um, where that you know finally somebody came up with the idea that said, "Look, just seeking revenge isn't helpful. Yes. At some point, somebody has to be willing to say, okay, um, I, I will just suffer the harm that you have done to me, and I won't seek revenge. In fact, what I will do is I will just return love. I will forgive you and return love. That's the only way that you're that we're going to get to peace." That's the only way we're, the world's going to get to be a better place if we do that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you know, in counseling, I discovered this through years of counseling. It's you're just so much better off when you can learn not to take offense when someone does something, even with the intent of of offending you, because so much of that is something going on inside of them. You know, uh, it doesn't define you, and when you can. You can sort of get to the place where you're not defined by someone's opinion of you or what they say about you, and you understand that that's something going on inside of them. It becomes much easier than to just forgive them, you know, or try and help them pass that because it's not personal. Yeah. You know, and and people who can kind of reach that level of maturity, they do good in the world. They make the world a better place. Now, again, maybe they only do that in the 21st century. Maybe those people didn't survive very well at all. 5,000 years ago. I don't know. I, I don't really well. know. You know that, That's for sure. <laughs> but it does, but we are here now. Yeah. We, we did get to this place, and it does seem to me that we got to this place uh, because people said, 
the only way the world gets better is that way. So, so here's what I think I could say, and I'm even thinking about it now as we're talking about it. The way in which you might be able to say, well, love is better than hate is because, you know, hatred, selfishness, and so forth can be a survival mechanism, but one that does not allow society to grow past a certain point. Yeah, it's limiting. Right, it's limiting. Whereas learning to love seems like it's not limiting. It seems like it can take society further along. We can become, we can all live, live in a much, much better world uh, because of love. Hate doesn't seem to produce that. Anger, selfishness, none of those things that we call negative seem to produce that. And somehow we've gotten here and throughout sacred scriptures, and it's not just the Bible, but the Bible is a good example of those kinds of, of moral um, leaps. principles and leaps. They're, they are there. And it, it, it is clear that learning to love your enemy, I think the more people that can do that, the more we bring about peace, the more we heal the people who aren't doing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and so that's one of the things I would talk about with people in counseling. I'd say, look, when you take offense at somebody in your workplace or family, whatever, because they've said something and you don't recognize that it's more about what's going on inside of them than you, and you take offense, and so then you defend yourself. Well, immediately conflict arises. Right. There's now there's conflict, and 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 both of you get more angry, and. And now it's a back and forth. Now there is conflict. There's a war going on, right? Um, whereas when you don't take it personally, and you can even g go to a place where you can say, look, even though I don't even really agree that what you're saying about me or whatever is true, um, for whatever reason, you have these negative feelings that you associate with me, you can say to them, you know, I'm sorry that you feel that way. So That's that right. was something that I would counsel people and say, look, here's, here, you know, learn to not take things personally. And then when somebody says things like that or conflict arise, learn to just say, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, because you, now you have de-escalated uh, what would otherwise be a conflict. And if you can find it in yourself to say, you know, is there a way I can, I can make you feel better? Yeah. So now you're willing to, you know, and someone's, well, it's not my, not my responsibility to make them feel better. And that's one of the things you see in, in the scripture is, is, well, you are your brother's keeper. Yeah. You are your brother's keeper, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, it is my responsibility, you know, to help yeah. you get At least if you believe in God. Uh, well, that, I mean, and see, that's the thing. Even if you don't, what that's- It still is a better at, way to be. It, right. It, is that it makes the world a better place. So- Well, you said- it's not my responsibility. Yes, it is your responsibility yeah, right. because the scriptures say. So yeah. that's for the person that it, does believe in that's God. That's right. Or, you're or kind of obligated, okay? Right. And even, but, even if you don't, if you want the world to be uh, a better place for everyone, including you, right? Because if you, if you respond uh, with offense and anger, you've now, you now create a war, and now you're in that war. Yep. Okay. The war isn't as good as peace. Okay. When when you're pretty at conclusive, odds, folks. Right. When you're at odds with someone and you're trying to, in some sense, hurt each other, that's not as good. Ne both of you are going to live a worse life than if you're both trying to help each other. Yeah. Okay. That's clear. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah. So these these moral dictates and principles that we see do seem to have moved society in a direction that makes it possible for us to keep moving forward yes. and for the world to keep becoming a better and better place, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that's, I think that's pretty powerful. I think that's really worth, worth thinking about. And so you and I having these discussions is love, is it just biological or is it transcendent? What is it? How do you measure it? All of those things all of these sort of revelations come from thinking deeply about this concept of love, yeah. which is why we should do it. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and that's why I, you know, I will often, you know, criticize people, you know, and, and give you a hard time, give Troy a hard time. You're constantly telling God loves us. Well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean God loves us? Yeah. 
define that for me. What you know, um, because I think it's worth talking about yeah. what we even mean because. It, if it has a real impact, if it's there because it, it's real, in some sense it's real, whether it comes from God, it's transcendent, or it's just a brute, All we know is that it, it's, it's something a, real. It's something real that has a positive impact, mm-hmm. and you believe in it, um, it. It's worth you understanding what that means for you. Yes. And how, how to live your life and conduct your life in, in such a way that you bring those things about. So, you know... It, it just and there's just so much hypocrisy in the church. There's just so much of you know on Sunday morning giving lip service to love is wonderful. Uh, we need to love like Jesus, and you know, and no it's, real it's thought very, put right, into it's, what that actually what that even means, means, and therefore what it entails. Right. right. Yeah. Yep. What it means for you as an individual. What it means to do it on a corporate level. Um, which, you know, that's one, another one of my gripes about the church is that we've just become this sort of like self-help place, right? Where you come, you know, on Sunday morning to get, you know, some advice on how putting Jesus in your life can make your personal life better and more, mm-hmm. more fulfilled. And, and we seem to, to me, to leave out uh, one of the core messages, which is replete throughout the scriptures, especially in the Christian uh, scriptures, which is n- n- be willing to accept adversity. Okay, it's not all about making your life better. Be willing to accept adversity on behalf of your brothers and sisters. I mean, it's throughout. It's it everywhere. Is, especially and, in the New Testament. Right. Yeah. And, and it's also given in such a way that says, and, and do this corporately. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, what we talked about in your Sunday class here, just, uh, you know, it's popular now among, you know, feel good evangelical Christians, you know, to say, I don't believe in religion. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, you know, um, you disagree with Jesus and Paul because they were both religious yes. people who believed in religion and believed in it as a kind of institution. And you're disregarding um, the basic etymology of the, of the of the word religion when you do right. when you say things like that because in reality this is this is a word that means to rebind reconnect right so you are religious right. if you're trying to do that okay right yeah so i mean in other words do, do you believe the popular phrase now uh, well, here in a lot of, of more progressive churches is i'm a follower of jesus well okay if you're a follower of jesus um then I guess that means that you're supposed to live the way Jesus taught to mm-hmm. live, you know? Well, what Jesus said was, you know, be willing to give your life for your neighbor, you know, what he... Take up your cross. Yeah, take up your cross. Um, and also negative things, you know, like, look, if a person is like living... Like taking up your cross isn't? <laughs> well, but I mean, for other people. Oh, yeah, you know, if yeah. some, You know, like the passage where he says, you know, if a guy, if he offends you, you know, if he sins against you, go to him. And say, look, you've done this wrong to me, right? And if he's unwilling to repent, it says bring a couple other people from the church. And it says specifically so it can be in the sight of two or three witnesses. Mm-hmm. So what he meant by that is that you can find people that that agree with you that, yeah, look, dude, what you're doing here is wrong. And then if he still won't repent, get the whole church. Because then if the entire church says, dude, right, what you're doing is wrong, and they all agree on that, then probably what you're doing is wrong, <laughs> Okay, and you should repent of it. Mm-hmm. That's like not very popular to talk about now. No. You know, and, and it's like, and, and they say, he says, and if he still won't repent, okay, now treat him as a pagan. Now, it's worth talking about what Jesus meant by that because they didn't you know, he, he, pagans. right, yeah. that's right. In fact, they cared for them, they loved them, yeah. you know. It, pagan was a word that meant. You know, but uh, you're not you, he, uh, a rural hick, like yeah. That, that's kind of what we. But he, I mean, he meant an unbeliever. Ignorant. Like you're not yes. really, and the reason you're not really a believer is because you're not willing to live in a way that's in accordance with what I'm teaching here. You know, and and that in part comes from uh, the wisdom of the entire body of the church. And so clearly, and there's other passages where when Jesus is talking about talking to the apostles, he says, you know, whatever, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And so, and he made it very clear, whoever sins you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. He made it very clear. And Paul makes it even more clear in his writings that yes, there is a hierarchy. 
there are people who will be more spiritually mature than than other yes. people and that those people should make the decisions and if you're not if you're not there as a member of the body or of the church part of what you're supposed to do is submit is submit to their authority right and that's the only way um that's the only way uh, an institution can move forward in a healthy and productive way. Yes. Okay. Um, Which all sounds obvious when you when you lay it out. Of like course that. it does. But we all kind of reel against it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you're it's right. just me and I, God. I mean, it's just you know, yeah. and and that is, um, and so yeah, I, I think that the reason, and what uh, again, one of my big gripes with religion and the the church specifically, the Christian church in the 21st century, is that they're ignoring so many of the historical principles that were found in Christ that were really, really good principles. And this, yeah, look, I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm probably, I'm as close to an atheist as you can be with now just being an atheist, right? I mean, uh, I don't believe the scriptures are inspired by God, you know, and all of that. You know that about me. Uh, You know, but no matter what's true, I mean, those I pray the, for your damnable yes, soul thank you. every night. <laughs> those those <laughs> principles, if you're going to say you're a follower of Jesus, I mean, and I would agree that most many of those principles are powerful principles that seem to make the world a better place, whether there's a God or not. Yep. Okay, so um, it seems to me that the hypocrisy in the church, when they say things like, oh, I don't believe in religion, and then what they really practice is just, you know, how can Jesus make my life better and what advice can I get so that I can be feel more fulfilled and, you know, and that kind of thing and not be willing to suffer adversity for my brother and sister, not be willing to submit to the authority of the church and say, okay, right, this, I should not be doing, this is, my wife and I are going to counseling with the pastor and, you know, the pastor's saying, look, what you're doing is wrong here. What you're doing is wrong. You guys need to change this. You need to work on this, you know? And it's just like, um, no, I just, all I have to do is is feel at peace with God. And that means I'm right. And that's so clearly wrong. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, you and I have seen so many examples yeah. of that. And having that belief is not only wrong, it's harmful. It ends up being harmful. And so that's, I guess, maybe the overarching message here is, you know, not that we have necessarily found or or can find concise definitions for things like love, you know, um, but that we do have an idea of what it is, and that comes from thinking very hard about it, and those ideas then then dictate to us and have some authority in our lives as to how we should live our lives and conduct ourselves. Yep. Uh, and when you don't think hard about those things, you end up having beliefs and behaviors that are in fact harmful. And and that you're unconscious to that you I, I think anyway. No, I think that's often. I mean, we've case, seen yeah. many examples yeah. of that in the church. Yes. Many many examples. Yeah. By the church, just as a disclaimer, we don't specifically mean Sun Coast. Right. We <laughs> but, yes. Um, the the lion's share of, in fact, to be more specific, the 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 religious institution of what could be classified as evangelical Christianity does a lot of the things that you're, that you're describing, um, to feel good, the hyper individualism, the, um, the no accountability really, uh, to anything that actually matters, um, belief in things that don't actually require anything of you, um, and so on. And, and the man, the lack of manifestation, absolute about the Trinity manifesting, (laughs) you know, however mysterious it is actually manifesting love, uh, the way that we see it exhibited in the New Testament, um, that this is this is a problem, and it yeah. has been harmful, and yeah. you can see the repercussions of that harm uh, throughout our society today, probably more than you ever yeah. have ever seen it. Um, right. So even yes, devout, we are railing against that, yeah. and, e- and e- I think it's yeah. worthy of that. I agree. So. I agree. Well, I think we do. I think Suncoast does do that. Uh, because it seems like what we're willing to do is we're, we're willing to think really hard about beliefs that don't really matter, uh, but that are different between to convince ourselves that we're right. So yeah. we're willing to think yeah. really hard about whether or not you should get dunked in baptism. You know, I mean, a lot of 
churches, you know, to convince ourselves that we're right in dunking someone rather, you know, things that, that really don't matter, or, or, but we'll convince ourselves that somehow they're so important. Yeah. But then in, in the, the, how is it Jesus put it? He said, you know, you, you'll gag at a gnat, but swallow a camel. Yeah. You know, it's this like, what are you doing? Like, this is so, this is the obvious behavior of so many right. in the, in the so-called Christian world. It, it, where they'll strain out a net and in the process swallow a camel. Right. Which means something in the Christian world in case you're not Christian. But um, yeah. it, it means that you're willing to ignore the things that actually matter for the things that don't. Yeah. In favor of the things that don't. Right. And that is not love. Yeah. No matter how difficult it is to define concisely, it, it is we know it when we see it and we know it when we don't see it. And that is not love. And that's, I think, a good place yeah. to end this discussion, yeah. um, because the world, <laughs> as cliche as it sounds, um, the world needs more of love. Yeah. You, you, if we're going to keep you got me forward. there, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. less yeah. hate, more love. Yeah, great. All right, man. Thanks. All right.